Hey folks, Damon Vrabel at the Council on Renewal. I want to follow up Renaissance 2.0 with a second video series focused on money. Some specific issues we need to clear up because it seems like nobody understands the issue of money and what the problems are that's causing the United States to enter one of the more dangerous phases of its life. The profession of economics completely hides the issue or confuses it or muddies the water, whether it's neoclassical neoliberalism or Austrian theory or monetarism or chartalism, it doesn't matter. None of them will talk about the key issues that I'm going to address in this series. And the first two things I need to cover in this video before we get into more detail about the monetary system is the issue of debt and debt-based money. Because I've used that term in articles and videos and people don't know what I'm talking about. We need to get real specific about it. And second, the issue of privately held balance sheets. Now, to explain both of those, I need to explain what a balance sheet is overall. And many of you know this already. They teach it at business schools and accounting schools, but even those schools don't teach the issue that I'll talk about in the series, mainly Machiavellian power. So a balance sheet is a T diagram with assets on the left and liabilities or debt on the right. And this is used to paint the picture of someone's financial condition at any given time. A, a person or a government or a business to show how many assets they have versus debt. So let's say you, know, you live in a $100,000 house or you rent a $100,000 house a rental property and you had to get an $80,000 loan from a bank for that house. So that's 100k asset and 80k debt. Now the important difference here is that an asset is what makes money for the person or the government or the business reflected in the balance sheet and the liability loses money. It costs you money over time plus you owe it back to someone else. It's not something that you will keep. And in a world governed by money, where money rules the world, it's what determines power, if you have something that makes money, that increases your power, or the person, uh, or the government, or the business's power. And liability, since you lose money, it decreases a person's power. That's the key Machiavellian dynamic that no one will talk about in schools. And of course, why would they? The people with power don't want other people being taught the rules of the world. But remember this diagram. You're going to see it in a lot of the other videos. The T diagram and what makes money and loses money and makes and loses power. It may seem boring or you may wonder why we're talking about balance sheets, but it really is the most imp it gets to the most important source of power in the whole world. I'm going to draw another balance sheet up here. Again, assets on the left and liabilities on the right. And this one is going to be the people's balance sheet, the population of the United States. And this will be the banking system's balance sheet. Is this a, you need to see this picture in order to understand our monetary system. Just reading Austrian theory about the need for intrinsic value or reading the gold bugs about the need for gold backing. That, it's not true and reading the monitors about the quantity theory of money. It all misses the, this issue here, where all money in our system comes into the economy as an asset to the bank. What an amazing power, isn't it, to be able to create electronic digits, put them on your balance sheet, something that makes money and gains power for you. Because they aren't really loaning anything, they're just adding electronic digits to someone's bank account, and it's people that sign up for debt. So all money comes into the system as a debt to the people. It's on the liability side of their balance sheet. All money comes into the system that way. And so what do you know already, just based on this diagram? Well, you know that the monetary system, by its very design, is designed to make money and gain power for the banks. And over time, lose money and reduce power of the people or the government or other businesses that aren't aligned with the banking system. Whatever is on this balance sheet over here, it doesn't matter what it is, everything else besides banks can only get debt as far as source money coming into the system. It all comes into the system as debt. 
Now, isn't that a bit ridiculous to have a monetary system that only serves a few people in a nice clique over here and is designed to, to diminish the power of everyone else? And that's the first major point I wanted to make. Now, this means a lot of things that we'll get into in other, other videos, and I addressed it in Renaissance 2.0 to some degree. But one of the things this means is that Austrian theory, the Austrians who say we just need to save more, and that'll fix our economy. Well, it's, it's impossible to have net savings in a system where all money comes from debt. That was, that's an illusion now. It's been an illusion for 30 or 40 years. It was true back when Austrian theory was written, back when the people had money that was an asset to them, and they could store in the bank for a fee, and then the banks could use it for investment. That real savings could exist back then. It cannot exist now. now on a net collective basis, it can't exist because everyone's in debt. They can make an illusion of it by hiding it on the government balance sheet, and that's what we did for a long time. But there is no net savings. That's not the solution. The other thing to mention is that this is usury. It's monolithic usury. It's a pyramid system where a few people kind of live off the backs of everyone else. And that seemed like a good thing in its first, in the first phase, in the first few phases. But now we're getting to the point of saturation. And we're getting to the point where people are realizing their debt slavery condition. And so that's a problem, having a monetary system built 100% on usury. Now this also sets up a major divide in the world between, on the one hand, capital holders. These are the richest people in the world, the richest pools of capital in the world. And on the other, generally, we'll just say the people. So you have private capital holders versus the people. And the capital holders control the private banking system. And this is the ultimate source of power in the world. Because it's even more powerful than just owning assets on your balance sheet. Whereas the capital holders sit above even balance sheets and they use their power to control balance sheets. Not only do they control the banking system, but through the banking system, they control everybody else's balance sheet, all the other people, governments, and non-bank businesses. So these are the ultimate Machiavellian uh, controllers in our system. So that's the second point, that this is private capital. It's a privately held monetary system. The monetary system itself is privately held. Don't believe the lie that government prints money. It hasn't happened in ages. It's not true. We get liquidity, we get money from going into debt ultimately to the private capital holders. And they're not the only ones over here on this side of the world. You also have the, you know, like the top MBAs, the people that come out of the top business schools and go to work for the elite banking system. The top JDs, the top lawyers, they go to the law firms that work with the banking system. Oh, and the top economists. Economists basically work for the banking system. It's no surprise then that they don't talk about this fundamental issue. Nobody wants you to know about that. And I don't even know if it's deliberate when it comes to the economists. The, the issue with economists is they don't live in the real world of balance sheet and Machiavellian competition for assets on the balance sheet. They deal with theory. In fact, I don't think I ever heard the issue of a balance sheet discussed in any of my economics courses. And I had a lot of economic training. So, not only do you have these really driven, really smart people serving the private capital holders, so it's a really powerful system, they've also learned how to get things like courts over here. The top corporate officers in the system. Uh, advertising. Um, top politicians, people like the President, the Treasury Secretary, the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, they're all kind of over here aligned with the capital holders and the banking system. Basically, whoever wants to be in the world of money and power, they're over here, and everyone else is stuck in the world of diminishing money and diminishing power. The elite, the purpose of private elite schooling is to gain access to this little clique. So, 
That's the basis of our monetary system. It's the basic divide that it sets up between the money pushers over here and the people that serve the pushers versus the money users that have to be in a scarcity condition borrowing and paying back more than they borrow back to this side. Now, because it's privately held, this also means that we're living in exponential growth. Economists will study this issue and wonder why the debt grows exponentially, why the United States government debt is where it is today. Because they have complex mathematical models that say that debt should be able to be steady state. Well, again, that's because economists live in the theoretical world. They aren't looking at the issue of who owns the balance sheet, who controls the monetary system. It sits on privately held balance sheets controlled by private capital holders, which means return on capital dictates the monetary system's growth. The capital holders demand a 2 or 3 or 5 percent return every year. That's exponential growth. So it's no accident that the United States government's debt keeps increasing exponentially. The politicians will love to put on a stage show arguing back and forth. Oh, oh, Republicans, it's the Republicans' fault, it's the Democrats' fault. Every four years they make the same argument and they don't bother to notice that it never changes. The exponential growth curve continues. You would think that they'd be like, huh, hmm, maybe it's not our fault. But they don't bother to notice that it doesn't matter who is in power over here, the system must grow exponentially because of this private nature. The banks grow it by growing this money sitting on their balance sheet, which mathematically by definition means that the people's debt and the government's debt over here has to grow exponentially. Again, it's just the fundamental design of our monetary system. I'm not talking politics or ide ideology here. I'm talking about mathematical fact. And so those are the two key issues I wanted to get across in this first video. And hopefully you start seeing the power dynamics in the monetary system and how this is the ultimate source of power in the world. Just think about the size of the U.S. monetary system, the amount of power sitting here in the banking system and the private capital holders that control it. Machiavelli never dreamed of such power. Hey, hey folks, I wanted to talk now in more detail about the specifics of the U.S. monetary system to go through what uh, the Federal Reserve System really is. And I talked about in the int introduction this concept of debt money which I'll explain in more detail in a different video because there's a lot more to what really backs the debt monetary system. But I talked about banks issuing money as an asset to themselves and a debt to the people. And this is a world of sort of people on one side and capital on the other, and capital interests, the people that serve capital on this side of the world. What I didn't mention yet is that the money for the people is attached to interest and it has to be paid back, all of it, so this is sort of pure private sector monetary system where you would have rich people forcing other people to go into debt to them, working for them, giving them value, return on capital. Uh, but of course now we have governments as well. Let's say the US government up here, which has its own balance sheet, and states, of course, which had their balance sheet. Now, the U.S. government was supposed to control money and regulate its value according to Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. That's the government's explicit role. But they don't. All they can get is debt. Over here on the liability side of their balance sheet. And same with the states. All the states can get is debt. And they have so much debt now that they're pretty much out of business. If they're not states anymore, they're administrative districts of the capital machine. Uh, and it's just a matter of time before the same dynamic happens with nations. So <clears throat> when the government wasn't doing its job, you had local banks that could engage in their own practices of inflating and deflating. So you might have a local bank in Des Moines, Iowa, serving local farmers, like corn farmers in Iowa, and the bank might be run by capital holders in London or New York. Um, but the bank could inflate the market and then deflate it and drive all the farmers off the land, collect the land for the banks and the capital machine, and then sell it off to doctors and lawyers and MBAs, the people that serve the capital machine, or the people that get paid by the capital machine. And that's exactly what happened. That's how the Midwestern farming 
industry was restructured and taken out of the hands of farmers. So the farmers are now nothing but tenants on land held by lawyers and business people. Um, and while the Des Moines bank was inflating, you might have a bank in Philadelphia or Orlando or wherever deflating or doing whatever they wanted with their own, their own uh, notes and their own banking practices, inflating and deflating. And so it was chaos. It was constant booms and busts on a regional basis and multiple currencies. And so the people, the states, and the government all realized the need for a regulatory system. They basically realized the need for the government, for the feds to do their job, according to Article 1, but of course they didn't, and so we had this thing called the Fed. And the Fed would have most people believe that it sits on this side of the world and it just regulates the money pumped out by the government. That's, that's kind of the common misconception that most people have. The government prints money and the Fed controls the quantity. Doesn't happen at all. Hasn't happened. Well, it never happened uh, under the Fed. Um, uh, in fact, it's the exact opposite. The Fed is a mechanism by which the government is put in debt to control the people. Because uh, the Fed really doesn't sit on this side of the world. The real power of it sits on this side of the world. The Fed sits on both. It's really a sort of a fascist organization between big government and the big capital interests. But the power is in the 18 primary dealer cartel banks. Those are the biggest banks in the United States. J.P. Morgan Chase, that's the main bank. That's the Fed bank. That's the bank with the real power. Goldman Sachs, really powerful bank. Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Citibank. Um, the big banks in Britain, you know, Barclays or HSBC, the British Empire's foothold in Hong Kong and China. Uh, RBC, the foothold in Canada, RBS, foothold in Scotland, Deutsche Bank in Germany, BNP Paribas, Paribas in France, the big banks in Switzerland, and the big banks in Japan. Japan? What's Japan doing in this cartel? Well, that's the end, the end result of World War II was conquering Japan, conquering Germany, restructuring Germany such that it was forced into the Anglo-American banking alliance. That's the real result of World War II, and of course it brought in the rest of Europe as well. Um, and so this global cartel, this cartel that's basically in what people would call the North region of the world and the West region of the world. It's the North and the West, and they've been the growth engine through the 20th century. So it's a very powerful cartel, a very powerful monetary system with a very powerful currency. The people that claim the dollar is backed by nothing and it's just worthless paper couldn't be further from the truth. You don't get the most powerful empire in history based off worthless crap. So I'll get into that in a future video as well because that really needs to be corrected. You need to understand what's behind the dollar. Um, so all these banks have their own balance sheet. And they issue money to themselves, just like other banks do, as an asset. And they inject it to the corporate system as a debt to the corporations, or they inject it to the government as a debt to the government. And that is a what's called a bond on the big bank's balance sheet. And of course, other these are the private sector banks that engage in that business. And then you have the central banks of the world, the Bank of China, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, um, that do this as well, and they buy the bonds from the U.S. government. So basically a huge global cartel of capital holding the U.S. government hostage. They have a big gun pointed at the head of the U.S. government. And that gun forces the U.S. government to milk the people and farm the people for the capital system. So not only are the people being sucked over here through the commercial banking operation, but also being funneled up through here, through the government, and over to the cartel. Um, by the government being forced to go into debt to the banks. So it's a huge farming operation where the people engage in work. They're the ones creating real value. They're the ones sweating, commuting, doing jobs they generally don't like um, <clears throat> to serve the capital machine that needs its debt uh, paid off or needs to collect on its debt. So that's... Um, the dynamic of this monetary system where massive monetary flows are flowing from here over to here. And then 
It gets injected back throughout the world because, again, it's a global monetary cartel. And a lot of it might come right back into the United States, especially in the high-tech sector as it gets sucked, as high-tech products get sucked through the corporate system. And the corporate system's getting capital injection from here. Uh, they'll inject it back through Hollywood, of course. It's really important for them to control the minds of the people. And they'll inject it, of course, through the U.S. government because they need the government to, to engage in war, to restructure the world in the way that this capital machine wants it restructured. And of course, they make m massive money off of war. So those are the primary things that uh, receive liquidity, receive capital injections. And the people are forced to work for one of those sectors in order to have money. It only gets injected through limited sectors where the capital machine wants it, and then the rest of it is injected now, as you know, into the rest of the world, as we've seen the corporate system in move production in China and Brazil and India. And we see these banks injecting liquidity. You know, m most of these banks are international anyway, so they're taking liquidity and value from the U.S. and injecting it into their home countries and into other countries around the world to build the global capital machine. That's the monetary system of the United States, folks. There's no sovereignty here, no sovereignty here, and no sovereignty here. The only sovereignty is over here, this side of the world where the system is designed to make money and increase power. Over here, everything is managed basically as a cost center uh, where money is reduced and power is reduced over time. And then you have the elite banks also controlling not only the governments, states, and people, but also the smaller banks, because they package up a bunch of crap called toxic assets and derivatives and types of things that you've heard about in the last couple of years, and they force it onto the balance sheets of the smaller banks, all the rest of the banks in the U.S., so it's a hierarchical monetary system where the elite system has control over basically everything. There are still some small banks that aren't under this cartel's control, but just wait till the next phase of the crisis, and you'll see the government dutifully coming in because the gun to its head, taking, you know, seizing the small banks and basically absorbing them, uh, forcing them to be absorbed into the big banks. And then there's one state bank, North Dakota, that's not part of this system either. And of course, it's one of the soundest banks in the country now because it's not controlled by the private capital holders that have been removing liquidity from the system. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to lesson three. I decided to get up in the mountains for this one. You can't, I can't focus the camera on the unbelievable views over there, so you're stuck with this. But what I'm covering in this lesson was gonna be the last lesson of this series. But I decided to move it up for two reasons. One, it's really appropriate, having just described the animal farm, to talk about the civil rights issue of the 21st century. And second, I've gotten a lot of threats since lesson two, where I mentioned that I'll reveal what's behind the dollar in future lessons. Of course, what I've already revealed in the, in the first two lessons should answer the question for you, so if you just think through what's in those two lessons, you know the answer to what's behind the dollar. But I've been threatened from you know, I got a threat from someone supposedly named Nancy Russell. Who knows if that's her name? Who knows if, if it's even a female? But I traced her back to New Hope, Pennsylvania. Uh, she said that I'll be discredited and blown away if I move forward in this series. I got in threats from people quoting Sun Tzu. Every freak narcissist's favorite philosopher to quote because he justifies narcissism. He justifies destruction and uh, pummeling the other where life's all about victory and winning. You know, it's, a, it's the lamest philosophy on earth, but of course our system's run by freak narcissists, so that's who they quote. But his quote where he says, if you don't understand your enemy, you endanger yourself. I got a lot of those. And all of a sudden, it, it, there's a different twist to the type of traffic on my blog and the type of people that are emailing me. So, I got the message. And the message is to keep chugging along and reveal this information to the American people because it's essential to solving most of the problems in the United States today and most of the problems around the world. It's all related to this issue. This is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. People focus on international problems, you know. A lot of good people focused on noble causes like African poverty, Palestinian slaughter, Philippine starvation, South American oppression. All of those are worthy causes. 
but just focusing externally causes an inner blindness to the cause of the problem right here at home. The monetary system that I've described is the core of all those problems. So this is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. Adolescents are aware of this issue. You know, ever since the Eminem movement, <laughs> back with the, you know, the White America song and stuff uh, like that, where he was venting the angst of the adolescent. Um, because they're in touch with this problem, maybe not consciously, but subconsciously they see the meaninglessness of their parents' lives as they scramble around in hamster wheel to earn bank credit to pay debt and taxes and consume cheap products that break more and more. I mean, that's the essence of life now and the adolescents know it the adolescents that are labeled you know oppositional defiant or maladjusted it's because they're quite well adjusted to their hearts and their subconscious and what they feel in the world so they're aware of it foreigners are aware of it people holding up signs as our media goes into their countries when they're experiencing crises which were really just being conquered by our, our financial institutions they're holding up signs saying please stop the oppression but we don't listen. Let me tell you why I'm doing this. For the last year or so, I've been on this, uh, focused on this effort to change the monetary system. Because two years ago, I was a therapist. I was counseling low-income, uh, or students at low-income schools, low-income school districts on the West Coast. And one particular student was just a beautiful seven-year-old, a second grader with all kinds of hope and desire for his life but a lot of rage and sadness as well, because he didn't have a father. I mean, his father still existed, but he was working three jobs to put food on the table for his family. So effectively, the kid didn't have a father, and I was filling that need as a counselor, but he didn't need a counselor, he needed a father. But it's because of the monetary system that his father wasn't around. By definition, the monetary system requires most people to be in scarcity so that they're spinning on the hamster wheel, running faster and faster to earn bank credit to pay off their obligations. It's the simple math of the monetary system and for those who think this is socialist talk or communist talk, I'm sorry you don't understand basic math. You've been fooled and indoctrinated by the Ivy League and a bunch of windbags on CNBC and the media. It's the basic fundamental math of our system. It is an elite on top, living off the backs of the masses by putting them in a forced labor situation because of the scarcity of credit. Now, 100 years ago or 200 years ago, that was called slavery. 500 years ago, it was called feudalism and serfdom. Today, it's called the free market. This free market is human enslavement for the people on, you know, from your perspective on the left side of the whiteboard that I've been describing. So it's a, to, to continue with the metaphor, it's a slave master and slave system. When I was counseling that seven-year-old, that's when I decided to join this macro effort. Because there are plenty of people trying to do good work, trying to participate in healing and redemption. But their efforts are suppressed by the macro system. The minorities in the third world have been trying to get us to listen for years and we haven't, but now we're waking up and so let's join the cause. All right, so, so let me speak to a few specific groups. First, to you economists. And most of you don't know about this because you're focused just on studying the economic system and not thinking about the monetary system that hovers above it. They're two different things. The economic system is the value generation system. The monetary system is what determines who collects that value, who gets to monetize it and put it in their bank accounts. You need to step outside the box and look at the bigger system. And some of you already do. Some of you know the system and you're not speaking up because of a paycheck and career interest, so you're basically selfish. You need to speak up. I know some of you from my days at Harvard. And then there are others of you that are serving the system, like Larry Summers. And <laughs> Larry, everybody knows you're beyond hope. You're a lost cause, you're a lost soul. So I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to everybody else who knows what's going on and has a conscience. Corporate leaders and people serving the corporate system, you need to wake up. Stop being blind and getting up on a daily basis and commuting, commuting into work on, in your Porsche and then hanging out with a bunch of robots in suits and then going to happy hour with them and then repeating that cycle day after day for a nice big paycheck. 
you're blind to what you're really doing in the world, to how you're serving this imperial system. Corporations are dependents of the system and they fuel the growth of the system. Stop being a frat boy for a paycheck. Get a meaningful life. Nobody remembers the business leaders once they pass on. We remember spiritual leaders and philosophical thinkers and people that are trying to improve the world and change the power structures of the world. Why don't you follow in their footsteps and stop having a meaningless life of sales and PR? That's all it is. It's a fake life. And you know this deep down. Having worked with you, having, having participated with you in this system, I know that you feel this. But the paycheck keeps you running, the, running around the horse track. You're like a horse race or a race horse with blinders on running around the track because the little, the little carrot's out there dangling in front of your face. Is that all you are as an animal? Like a Pavlovian dog responding to incentives? Come on. Lawyers, you're particularly responsible because you're agents of this system. You went to law school initially for justice, but now you know the Constitution's out and the Uniform Commercial Code is in, which enshrines the capital holders at the top of the system. The UCC means that all courts care about are those top capital holders. Snap out of it. Fight for justice in the world rather than serving the bankers as they get ready to foreclose on the country. And then law enforcement. I know a lot of you. I know your hearts. Having been a military commander and having worked with law enforcement, I know you. You've got good motivations for getting into those fields. But you are manipulated and co-opted and indoctrinated and brainwashed by the power structure. Any, any one of you that enforces an order from a court that's serving the banks and kicks the lower classes out of their homes and takes their property to hand it over to the richest people in the world, you're scum. You don't deserve your badge. You don't deserve your uniform. You're an embarrassment to the profession. And they've converted you from having pride and doing good and serving your community to now you have false pride and this tough guy pride, this narcissist pride. Stop beating up college kids for the imperial banking system. Every G20 pro protest, that's all that is, because you think you're Robocop. And then everyone else, again, what could be your story? What's your motivation for joining this cause? This problem that's causing all the problems in the world. Stop serving the imperial system. The more that we all commute daily into that system and participate in it, the more it grows. And the more it grows, the more value it extracts, the more the republic declines. It's an inverse relationship. So as that grows, you lose all your freedom. And it's time to reverse that. Stop serving this pathetic system and rebuilding the republic, rebuilding your local communities. Instead of getting up and racing off to work in the morning, get up and go out and meet your neighbors again. Rebuild neighborhoods and local communities. Turn off the television. Never watch it again. It's a joke. Do something meaningful. Join a meaningful crusade. We all have that motivation to be part, to be part of, of good, to be part of a good cause. And we've been co-opted since 2001 with the 9-11 attacks and the war on terror that, to think that that's our good cause, when really that's just a symptom of this problem I'm talking about. You're being manipulated to join the wrong cause. And all the great soldiers out there, I know your hearts, I totally know. And all the military officers, especially the West Point graduates that are all about serving the Republic, and you're, you're still committed to the original American ideal, but you're being co-opted and manipulated. You're being played by the Ivy League freaks running the intelligence apparatus. Watch The Good Shepherd again to see who is, who is making, who's developing your orders. And join this cause. Be the next Martin Luther King. Be the next Gandhi. Where is the next Martin Luther King and the next Gandhi? Why does nobody speak up anymore? And now we can't depend on one leader because they've co-opted the national media system and so there's no way for a, for a new national leader to lead the cause. But in fact, that's not what's going to save America anyway. The Jeffersonian idea was that we, we self-govern. We rule our own lives. Now, the flaw is that perhaps Jefferson was just dreaming of an idea that isn't true. And the evidence would suggest that it's not true, that people don't want to govern themselves. They'd rather be lead. But we can't do that anymore. We need to step out of 
needing to be led. I'm not your next leader. And no politician is. Ron Paul isn't. We've got to lead ourselves. We've got to be our own king and be our own queen, and be our own sovereign. And then the system will start adjusting. But Martin Luther King said that our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about things that matter. So here's the question. When you get up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror, are you dead? Hey everybody, welcome back. It's casual t-shirt Friday at the Council on Renewal. You know, I've gotten some grief for not looking the part of an expert. I guess for not looking like Robert Rubin, Jamie Dimon, Hank Paulson, and the types of people that have brought the global economy to, its, to the precipice. We've been trained to think they're the ones to listen to when they are just salesmen on TV repeating whatever they need to say to sell you into your own destruction in return for a paycheck. It's the type of people they, they are. So I specifically made a decision at the beginning of the series that I wasn't going to do that. Is I wanted to break out of that paradigm. I wanted to see if we could break away from uh, the indoctrination to look to those types of people for expertise. When we should be listening to normal people. When I was a kid, you know, the types of people worth listening to were the farmers that showed up at the donut shop in overalls and they had mud on their boots because they're connected to the ground and they do real work. That's an example of the type of people we should be listening to. Wendell Berry is one particularly uh, important sort of modern prophet that I think we should be listening to now. We should be listening to, as I said, just normal people. We should be listening to, you know, the adolescents in our neighborhood. Adolescents have an amazing ability to see through adulthood uh, fakery. I don't know why adults don't have this ability, but adolescents can sense when someone is kind of just being a schmuck even though they have a suit and they look good. Adults get sucked into the establishment way of thinking. We must break out of that. If we can't break out of that, there's not much hope because Wall Street's always going to be able to find a better salesman than me and the other people that are trying to reveal the truth. I've also gotten some grief for the small whiteboard. And uh, <laughs> again, I decided I'm not going to build a CNBC studio to make it look all professional because all that's fake. That's all fake setting designed to make you think it's Ooh, it's more important than you. It, it's it, the people that are there are more credible and part of this important machine that you're, you and the, your neighbors aren't a part of. And so you as sort of like unimportant people need to listen to these important people. I, that's so important to break out of that. So I just decided to go with this and I wanted something I could throw in the back of my truck and take on the road and do these videos wherever I am. So I hope that a uh, small whiteboard and dress doesn't affect your ability to discern truth and competence from spin. In this lesson, I wanted to revisit the first two lessons. Um, I, got in, I got an objection from lesson one that I wasn't completely explaining the monetary system because people said, hey, you know, all the money isn't just debt to people. It gets deposited in banks, so it's a debt to the bank, and it becomes assets of the people. Uh, because it's their deposits in the bank. And yes, once the money is injected into the system, then it starts adding up as people and businesses and banks all interact. The money circulates as a medium of exchange at that point, and then both sides of the balance sheet start adding up. But that doesn't change the fact that it was all injected into the system initially as a debt to the people. It's just like a Vegas casino. When you walk into the casino, you have to borrow chips. And then you get to sit at the poker tables and circulate your medium of exchange and try to collect more of the chips. But at the end of the day, when you walk out, you have to turn all your chips in. Exact same thing with the banking system. All the electronic digits out there are chips owned by the banking system that you have rented and you get to use while the game is on. But at the end of the game, which is basically in deflation when the capital holders start pulling their chips off the table, and the banks have to call their chips in. That's when you see who controls all the chips. Even the stuff that you thought was an asset on your balance sheet, it's not. It's a conditional liability. It's all borrowed money. It all unwinds back to here. And it gets sucked back here and to here. So that's the way the monetary system works. And all the power is over here on this side of the world. 
But this issue of power is the key. The economics profession makes a big mistake in terms of microeconomics and how they built the theory of the firm. Is there's this underlying assumption that companies are in the business of profit maximization. It's not really true. That's a, that's a limited perspective on the income statement. Completely ignores the balance sheet and how companies go about engaging in warfare to gain market share, to conquer competitors and put their assets on their balance sheet, to move into new countries, to do those types of things that build the firm. And that's what corporations are really doing. They use the assets on their balance sheet as sort of like military armies to engage in that type of battle. Now with the military, it's gaining geographic territory. When it comes to corporations, it's economic territory. But when it comes to banks, the imperial Wall Street type banks, it's financial territory. And then it's more like the military geographic territory as well, because all those money center banks are, are kind of feudal lords over a certain territory. They control all the money within a certain territory. They control the chips that the people and the businesses have to use. They're the casino house for that territory. So economists that just model the banking institution for sort of steady state profit, they get it wrong. That's not what these imperial banks are all about. They're all about gaining ground. Um, we've seen this in the past with uh, you know Chase Bank working with institutions like the IMF, moving in to conquer countries like Argentina. We saw it in 2008, where Chase basically conquered Seattle by incorporating WAMU onto their balance sheet. They conquered Bear Stearns, incorporated them onto the balance sheet, and so J.P. Morgan expanded its power, gained power through, the, through that process. To get real specific, J.P. Morgan has like 75 to 78 trillion in derivatives under its control. Notional purchasing power that hovers above the economy. Huge power base. And that's like 22 times the size of the U.S. government's budget. So, who has the power here? This is a parent-child relationship. One of the big sources of control and power over a kid that parents have is the ability to control the money. They, they basically control the liquidity that flows through the children. Same exact thing here. The U.S. government has to come to this capital machine every week or two with its hands out. You know, well, please feed me, please give me my allowance for the week. It's in the subordinate position. And that 78 trillion is not only 22 times the size of the budget, it's more than five times the size of the whole American economy. That's massive power. All controlled by just one of these 18 imperial banks. So add all 18 together. And then that's just the sell side banks. It's not including the buy side power over here, all the hedge funds and the foundations and stuff like that. That's all part of this global capital machine. That is immense power. It's the most powerful entity on earth. Now, it's not like it's a smoothly run entity where everybody cooperates together. It is ruthless competition here, deadly competition. But there's a hierarchy in this machine. The bigger capital pools have hierarchical power over the others. And they all work together in terms of financially um, being aligned to maintain their power over controlling people's and government's money. Because the power and wealth that comes from that is, is immense. And it's not just the US. The people that will say I'm wrong in this because it's the, it's the country that has the power. It's the government ha that has the power and the banks are just sort of, sort of uh, servants of the government. It's the exact opposite. This is a global capital machine that has multiple governments under its control. We, we saw that with Greece where you know this machine basically formally tried to take over Greece earlier this year. They tried to do it to Iceland. They've done it to other countries in the past. Um, Ireland, just last week, was talking about negotiating with this machine in terms of how they're going to share the pain that the Irish people are going to be in now. And in the process of negotiating with different institutions over here, they were letting the most senior capital holders know, the top bondholders know, hey, we're not messing with you guys. You guys will get 100% of, of your money back. That's, that's a government that we're trained to think governments run the world. That's a government going to a small group of people saying, hey, we submit. So it's a demonstration of who really has Machiavellian power in the world. Then after lesson two, you're probably looking at this diagram saying, you know, come on, man, tell us what to do about this. Um, and I'll talk about this later.
in other videos, but just to get to some of that now. Some of you are probably looking at this diagram and saying, hey, it's just in the Fed. That's a big movement now, right? And we can solve the whole problem by just ending the Fed. I think the reason that's a big movement now and it's in the mainstream media and being pushed even is because a certain faction within this capital machine wants that to happen. They'd be happy with that. They've largely moved the capital to Asia. They've transferred the production machine to China. They, these banks have ramped up operations in Asia. The biggest banks in the world are now in China and this machine is trying now to align itself with them. It's very clear the 21st century is going to be driven through Asia and the financial centers of Hong Kong and Singapore and uh, Japan and then China is going to be kind of the churn center. That's the long-term direction for this machine. It's going to take a long time to bring that to fruition, but we're going to see in the 21st century the decline of the West as this machine shifts east and the rise of the east. So, I, I, you know, I think part of the machine would be happy with the American people basically cutting their own throat. Because if you just end this little box and don't deal with this and don't deal with this, then you're in a lot of trouble. Because it's just the funnel through which the government and the American people get funding from this machine. You cut off the funnel, you cut off the liquidity. The real power is over here, not here. The central bank is just the method to capture a government and take it private, submit it to this capital machine. So that governments are now capitalist entities just like corporations. It's a, it's a big myth that there's a difference in socialism capitalism now and the, the left versus right debate and business versus government. It's all controlled by this machine now. Or at least that's, that's the goal. Governments are managed as capitalist entities. Their financing is exponentially driven. So, that, so the government has to manage itself for exponential returns. You have to pay off the debt holders. It's one of the reasons warfare is a big deal. Because the government has to be able to provide collateral and service the debt that it gets from this capital machine. Okay, so I think we're a long way off from dealing with this level. Because in order to deal with it, you've got to understand this. And most people don't understand this. And then you got this level, where I kind of classify the anarchist and anti-statist and libertarian and Tea Party movement and Austrian economics, and um, where it's kind of just focused here, where it, it's got the idea in its head that it's all just people suffering under the tyranny of government, and we need to kind of break the power of this down, and that will allow us all to be free um, and have more of a free market. Well, again, I don't sh think that shows a sophisticated understanding of what's of the real power in the world. Um, and I'm amazed at some of the super intelligent people that advocate those policies that they, they somehow get muddied thinking as they think that the corporate empire system is free market or somehow not statist or not imperial. The corporate imperial system has been built under this capital machine. It is a global system that has no national loyalty and has no accountability to people. It's, all the accountability is up here, and the corporations are dependents of this system. They're basically sort of the, the servants of the system that are out there churning the bank liquidity and capturing value for this machine. So that's not free market in the least. And now that we've run this machine for decades, this Chicago School Ponzi-nomics, Harvard neoliberalism, um, where it's built this ruling oligarchy here in this machine, a massive dichotomy now in, in society. It's a predator-prey model that we have now. Wealth and uh, power disparity is bigger than it's ever been in history. You have a ruling oligarchy now that's possibly the most powerful ruling oligarchy in history, at least in history for a long time. And so this, when you have a society like this, that's precisely the wrong time to unleash the free market on the people. I think even Ron Paul has suggested something like this, where because he... I think has an understanding of the power of this machine and he has said that you can't just kind of go free market all of a sudden, that there has to be a transition period which would basically be government becoming stronger uh, to restructure all this and then return power back to the people, devolve power back down to smaller level entities like states and towns and communities and people. Like the Tea Party is talking about we need to put the banks through bankruptcy because that will like teach them a lesson. That shows a misunderstanding of the rule of law and contract law in the United States now. The Constitution's out, and we have the Uniform Commercial Code, which enshrines these people. And the, a banking institution is kind of a merger between these groups, 
And so you put the bank in bankruptcy, all that's going to do is force what's left in the people over to the capital holders. The people will lose everything that they haven't already lost. So if you're associated with the Tea Party or Libertarian Movement, uh, just talk about this issue and uh, let's develop a more sophisticated understanding of bankruptcy and contract law and the way the capital machine works. An example of the danger of bankruptcy now is with Bank of America. After 2008, Countrywide and Merrill Lynch were both forced up under Bank of America. I would suggest that was a Machiavellian power move. It was a setup because they knew the people would be demanding bankruptcy. <clears throat> and now if you put Bank of America through bankruptcy and the capital holders hold a lot of control in those assets and the, the mess in Countrywide, you're basically going to lose all the unprotected assets sitting in Merrill Lynch to the capital holders. And Merrill Lynch is the biggest retail house in, in the U.S. So all, the, all their wealth that's sitting in unprotected assets that the capital holders could get their hands on, it'll be transferred up to the capital holders. So bankruptcy is a mistake without restructuring this and the legal system as a whole. Hey everybody, welcome to lesson four. I decided to go with a college football motif in honor of all the frat boys out there in the corporate world. Now in this lesson I wanted to try giving you an alternative lens to use when looking at the global scene. Just like in lesson one of Renaissance 2.0, I said if you keep thinking that we live in a free republic, that you're going to be constantly frustrated because that just doesn't jive with reality in the U.S. today. And when you have a disconnect between your mental framework and reality, that causes, you know, confusion and frustration and psychological stress. And so I think it's useful to understand uh, not only the country we live in, but also the world we live in. And if you're just listening to like the TV and the newspapers, the, the daily worthless noise we get, you know, and we're trained to go to those sources for news, but it's all worthless news that doesn't help because they suggest that the world is just a random array of countries where the governments have the power to act on the world scene. Well, if that's your lens, then you're going to have a hard time understanding things like, huh, why are so many countries now uh, in their banking systems at the point of uh, collapse? Why is that a common trait across so many countries? Why are so many governments over their head in impossible debt? Does it make sense if every country is a random independent uh, sovereign body? Why, you know, for the last half of the 20th century did the kind of the North and the West, why was that the region for economic growth and the East and the South were suppressed? Again, doesn't make sense if it's just random sovereign countries where politicians have the power. So I propose an alternative lens that you can use that's not necessarily, you know, 100% true 100% of the time in 100% of the regions. But I think it's a useful lens to use when you find yourself confused and frustrated about what's going on and why, you know, if you believe your, your individual country has power and the politicians there have the power to really change the world for you and the citizens of that country, then you're, you're going to be stressed out. So I would suggest viewing the world as a um, kind of something that has a central capital machine and I'm going to call it the central heart of the overall global human body, you know, human civilization. Because money and liquidity is the blood that pumps through the system to keep the engine running. And most countries don't have their own autonomous monetary system. Some do, just so happens that those correlate nicely with the, uh, the ones that get um, the focus of like intelligence agencies and militaries and things like that. But most countries don't have their own independent uh, monetary system. Rather, there's this central capital machine. And people want me to name names here, but it's not about naming names. It's a, it's a system that incorporates and sucks so many people into it. You know, th there are institutions at the top, like the World Bank, the IMF, the Bank of International Settlements. Um, and, and then behind those are a lot of private capital, the biggest global capital pools in the world multi-generational wealth hidden in a bunch of LLCs you've never heard of and equity partnerships and foundations and some of the hedge funds and stuff like that. Um, 
and of course, it's not like all of these are cooperating nicely. There's, there's competing factions within the machine. And then you have the senior capital behind the dominant banks that I've described. You have the global central banks themselves. Um, you have the corporate system that's been built under the capital system. People are, are used to looking at the multinational corporations as those are the things moving into countries taking over territory. But above the multinational corporations is the capital machine. You know, you need the capital regulatory environment in order for corporations to move around within them. It's like, you know, being on a football field. You, you need the rules of the field and the refs and everything to, to uh, you know, for the teams to have freedom to maneuver and play the game. Same thing with corporations. They need, they need the game board on which they can play. And so this capital machine, they're the ones that determine that, it, that continually expand the game board as they try to move into new territories around the world. And then you, you have neoliberalism, the dominant economic philosophy in the U.S. that's been used specifically for that purpose, to expand the game board, to justify breaking down national sovereignty, breaking down borders at the country level, uh, so that the capital machine and the corporations under it have freedom to maneuver wherever they want. So despite all that, despite the fact that we see the global bond uh, market, the global central banks, the global regulatory institutions, the dominant senior banks that operate multinationally, and the multinational corporations, and then the philosophy of neoliberalism that's been used to justify all of this. People will still say, what I'm going to describe here isn't true. Well, good luck with trying to uh, make sense of the world when, if you think that it's just a bunch of random independent countries. Because it just doesn't fit with what we see on the world scene. And we see a manifestation of this capital machine, this central engine, at things like, um, you know, the Economic Forum in Davos. You see the multinational corporate uh, elites getting together and hobnobbing together, and that's the that's that's a manifestation of the people that are that serve this machine. And a lot of them don't have a clue what they're doing. They're just <laughs> they're just getting nice paychecks. They become billionaires because they're good salesmen. Um, and they have no clue that it's all controlled by the top-down capital machine. And then you have, you know, the types of people contributing to this. It's, it's your average person in the corporate world or your, you know, like the top MBAs, people coming out of the top business schools that go to work for the dominant banks. They're serving the system. They have no idea strategically what they're doing. They're just getting the paycheck. You know, they come right out of school and they get $200,000 a year. That's, that's a nice incentive to serve this system. Same thing with the top law schools. The top graduates that go to the law firms that work for the banks, they're, again, they don't necessarily know what they're doing, but they're building this capital machine, and building the power around it that is uh, becoming more powerful than countries. You know, you go to New York and there's bank skyscrapers and there's the law firm skyscrapers, and they work together to create this system. And it's not just in New York, you go to, you know, I mean, this, this capital, is uh, you know the senior capital, like the capital firms that I mentioned, and the LLCs. There's a lot of it in like the Upper East Side of New York, but it's all over the world. You know, there's a lot in San Francisco, a lot in Boston, a lot in London, uh, Tokyo, Frankfurt, Paris. It's all over, but they're all aligned and integrated by the global bond market, the global central banking network. They've run the world for the latter half of the 20th century with this divide, where we had the North and the West that were pumped up and inflated, and then the East and the South that were suppressed. Um, and this isn't mythology, this is the Federal Reserve primary dealer cartel that I've described in previous lessons and in articles. Um, you know, the primary banks in the US, the primary banks in Europe, and the primary banks in Japan. And then the dominant, you know, British banks and other banks that have power in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Canada. So this is an integrated banking alliance that has pumped up this region. You know, like the dominant uh, arteries, or the main aorta coming off the heart has been pumping up through here and pumping out over there. So that's been inflated while I would suggest interests associated with the capital machine or governments that are aligned with the capital machine have kept this region repressed. You know, we've seen communism here in a different form of control now, same thing with China. India, we literally saw the British Empire move in, try to take over with troops, but that didn't work. And then the capital machine moved in with banks 
and 40 years ago, Indira Gandhi, Indira Gandhi uh, nationalized the banks to defend India from the invasion of the capital machine. But at the end of the day, it didn't work. It shows you the power of this machine. It just keeps coming and coming as it inflates and gets more powerful. Um, at the end of the day, India has been subsumed into the machine. It's now part of the multinational corporate uh, territory. Africa, you know, we know the British Empire and other powers have fomented chaos there for a long time. Central and South America, same thing. We see a lot of chaos. We see a lot of cronyism. Um, we know that the U.S. government has been involved with that, and um, Anglo-American financial institutions have been involved down there, overthrowing governments and stoking uh, fear and chaos. So there's all different forms of maintaining control or preventing alternative power bases from forming. And this, uh, you know, the interests at the top of the capital machine here are kind of monopoly capitalists. They're not interested in competition. And it's been in their interest to maintain control over the large population, large landmass countries um, through the 20th century. You know, that's, that's the U.S., Germany, Russia, China, India, Brazil, you know, um, and they've used different forms of top-down control in those regions. On this side of the world, we've had capitalism. And we're trained to think that's freedom, that's free market, kind of bottom-up free activity. Well, that ignores the monetary system. The economic schools that claim that this is freedom don't get it. Because we have 100% debt. 100% of the liquidity driven through this capitalism, this form of capitalism, comes from here. It's all top-down injected through, from the capital machine through big government and through big corporations. Those are the main control systems that they want to use. And as liquidity gets injected through those systems, that sucks a lot of people into working for those systems. Because if you want a decent wage, um, you, have to, you have to go where the liquidity is. And so that's why we've seen, you know, in this version of capitalism, we've seen the destruction of Main Street, destruction of local communities, um, because the capital machine isn't interested in local community. They're interested in top-down control systems, hierarchical control systems like corporations and big federal government, not not local community government. So this is a form of top-down control in the high growth areas. And then in the area of the world where it's not high growth and it's kind of steady state because there's no arteries coming through it, it's just kind of small capillaries of capital that's allowed to circulate to maintain a subsistence level uh, of population or of steady state um, economic system. And, you know, there's been multiple systems over here, but let's just say the most, the most popular one is but the most famous one is communism. So that's another top-down control mechanism in a region where there's steady state activity. And now as we go through the 21st century, as globalization matures, as globalism becomes more dominant, um, you're going to see a shift. Because right now we have the north and the west kind of up here and the east and the south down here. Well, globalization is going to mature and they're going to reach parity here. So this side has to decline and this side has to grow. So you're going to see the capital shift. And it's just the natural result of market forces um, after you know, neoliberalism and the people that are trying to expand this capital engine have, have gained new territory. So with things like GATT, that opened up the capital machine to new regions of the world. And so just, just the natural math of the financial system requires now that the corporate system shift to this region and the capital shift to this region because that's where the returns are. Return on capital, that's what drives this system. And so there's less return on capital that's possible up here. So this is gonna shift. It's not, it's not conspiracy, it's simple math. Um, and you're gonna see uh, a new form of top-down control in this region because Capitalism, the debt-based form of capitalism we've had driven from banks as you're growing and it just increases debt. Well, that debt is a control mechanism over the population. Well, now that that is declining or at least reaching a steady state or potentially collapsing, um, you're going to need a different form of top-down control up here. I would suggest they've chosen the China model as we see the same types of police that we've seen in China for a long time now, we see them in other regions of the world, you know, it's the Darth Vader stormtrooper cops that come out in force 
uh, and demonstrate that they're an army against the citizens at economic meetings. We've seen all those protests of WTO and G20 protests and things like that. They look exactly the same across all the, you know, this whole region and this region. Um, straight out of the Star Wars series. I mean, you know, they're big black uniform, big armor, big shoulder pads, you know, big narcissistic um, images and helmets uh, and billy clubs that look like lightsabers. <laughs> so that's the system that we're seeing now being implemented. And I would suggest that that's akin to fascism. Now, some countries up here have been living in soft fascism for a while now, the corporate type fascism. But we're shifting now into a harsher form of fascism to maintain top-down control. And uh, you can an alternative perspective on fascism is to view it as a restructuring process, taking a country through foreclosure. We saw in Germany, you know, World War II was started because of the economic chaos and the debt situation Germany was in. Fertile ground for a dictator to stir up uh, opposition and, and, uh, and try to fight the powers that have it in debt. Um, and then the Allied response to it, part of the priority was to collect for the creditors. We saw that in 97 with Clinton's Iraq Liberation Act too. One of the primary justifications for um, regime change and invasion of Iraq was to collect for the creditors. Wars are always driven by economic uh, issues. So, um, so that's an alternative way to view fascism where Germany was foreclosed upon, it was restructured. They cleared out the debt and liabilities um, restructured everything such that it was aligned with the capital machine so that it could grow with it through the latter half of the 20th century. You get glimpses of this in a movie like Schindler's List where the primary narrative is the anti-Semitic, uh, you know, the Jewish narrative. And then you see little scenes where cops or the Gestapo or whoever is taking suitcases of things from the prisoners. And they're dumping them in, in piles and taking everything of value, every piece of metal, every piece of jewelry, and accounting for them. You see them writing very detailed notes in, in ledgers. That's accounting. That's banking. That's a foreclosure process you see happening. They're, they're clearing out the debt and the liabilities. And in that situation, it, they, they viewed humans as liability. And then recovering the assets, accounting for them, and reallocating them to the people that had claim on the assets. So I think you're going to see that sort of foreclosure process happen to clear out the debt that's in uh, some of these countries. I mean, the countries are, have impossible levels of debt now. And as Michael Hudson says, debt that can't be paid won't be paid. True. But debt that won't be paid is going to be cleared out and collected upon by those who have power. So I think you're going to see fascism in the U.S., potentially other British colonies, because they've been used to the high-growth consumer-type system, and that's changing. They're going to clamp down on it now. And then by 2050, we're going to see the more equalized uh, global system. And China will have emerged as the rising sun of Asia, the leader of the world, but it's all going to be controlled and managed by the central scientific capital machine, pumping blood equally through the overall body, the overall human civilization. So just one key insight is to view you know, communism, this form of capitalism, and fascism as three different types of top-down control over large populations, depending on how the capital machine wants to manage them. Are they in the high growth phase, or are they in steady state, or are they in a restructuring phase? But now it's not even appropriate to really see these as th three separate systems. Today we see a, uh, a melange of tyranny, if you will, um, like in China, where you, know, you go to Shanghai, it looks like New York. It's a capitalist, there's a lot of capitalist activity but there's fascist control system in place. And then if you go to the rural regions, it's more like communism. So we're seeing a more high-tech, more advanced version of top-down control now. And back to the frat boys I mentioned at the beginning in the corporate world, they're, um, they think that they're elites and that they're doing good things for humanity or whatever, but they're just betas and gammas in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, and we're seeing this Brave New World emerge now. So, <clears throat> Just like in second grade when those guys would get the gold star from the teacher and take it home to mommy for the pat on the back, they're doing the same thing now in the corporate world where the paycheck is, a, is the constant reinforcement mechanism to say, yes, yes, Johnny, you're doing a good job. And unfortunately, they don't know what they're doing and they've, built, they've helped build this system. So I hope this helps.
kind of make sense of where the world has been in the last 50 years and where it's going in the next 50 years. If you listen to politicians that are just talking about their, their individual country and policies inside the country, then you know they don't have a clue what you're talking about. And the whole idea that a politician, you know, voting a Democrat in or a Republican or a Labor versus uh, Tory or whatever, the idea that they're going to change things is part of the false framework that the country is in charge. Because those politicians can do nothing about this. And then same thing with economists. If you hear certain economic schools talking about uh, just focused on the state, on the individual country that's in charge of the territory they live in, and that it's kind of like state versus business and the state just needs to get out of the way and let the free market happen. That's just not consistent with the, reality, with the world we're living in, where the this, this state is not a sovereign state, it is an administrative district of this global capital machine. And that justification for the state to get out of the way and let the free market take over has been co-opted and twisted by um, the capital machine. It's just been used to help justify breaking down the power of the country so that the capital machine can have more power. It's funny, some of the people that, that are all about free market theory will talk about how if the US government gets involved in markets, my gosh, that's, that's communism and socialism. And then you'll hear them cheer a, you know, a company like Walmart. Well, Walmart is a retail extension of China. It's resulted in China, a officially communist slash, slash fascist government, owning a significant amount of the means of production of the American economy, or of the at least the the economy that the American consumers consume from. So, so yeah, if the U.S. government gets involved, that's communism. But if, if it results in a communist government owning your means of production, then that's free market. Some of this stuff is crazy, and you need to, you need to be able to think through this as you're listening to people tell, talking to you about solutions. They're either ignorant of the global system and they can't understand it, or they're deliberately misleading. Either way, they're not worth listening to.